before we begin, I just ask if we can bow our heads once more and I'll just open again with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this Sabbath day. Thank you that we can worship here and we know even if there are only two or three gathered in thy name, we, knew, we know you are also there with us. We thank you for the weather, we thank you for the fellowship, and I pray now as we shall spend some extra time in your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come here um, in this circle and also anoint my lips and what I may say that it may be thine and thine only. Be with us today and help us to be attentive just for these last few moments of this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you heard already, this brief little Bible study, if you will, is about the ten versions. However, I'd like to preface it by saying that when I first compilated this little talk, it won't be anything longer than 20 minutes. It, I called it Bridesmaids. So this story or a parable, it's very broad and it can cover an intensive amount of research, which I don't have the time to do. So if there's anything I didn't fully elaborate or get to cover, just please bear with me. This is just a very small snippet into that wonderful story. Um, I'm not trying to address this story from every single angle possible, so we're just touching on it just a little bit. So this is Bridesmaids. Everybody loves weddings. I think um, I've calculated from the time I was born, I think I've attended up to 12 weddings so far, which is more than some of my, some other people I know. So I've seen a lot and it's a season of rejoicing, of celebration and of uniting two people into a lifelong journey together. We don't often associate weddings with superficiality, delays and possible rejections. Whenever we hear of wedding, the words or the image that we conjure in our head is 100% positive. It's of love, it's of happiness, fellowship and celebration. But in this parable, this well-known parable that was told by Christ, he introduces a new dimension to this typical marriage story and brings out a significant lesson for our lives as believers. So in opening, if you have your Bibles with you, you're welcome to turn. We will open up with Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. So this is the account of the Ten Commandments in the book of Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. And I will just read here. Then the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, with, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So that's a passage that we have heard numerous times, and it's a very familiar one. Um, but for further context, let's delve into the cultural history at the time of this parable. Um, when I was younger, I was very uh, fixated on Jewish culture because I used to really enjoy writing in my free time. And I would study some of the uh, cultural traditions or how they lived their lives back during Jesus' day. So I thought it would be appropriate to look into that context for this story. So... For a Jewish wedding, we can summarize an ancient Jewish wedding in three parts, but I also want you to think of it in a symbolic way as well. So if we break down a Jewish wedding in three parts, it starts off with a contract, 
a consummation and celebration. So, for the contract part of an ancient Jewish wedding, the father of the bride and the groom-to-be would sign a legal document. And this document was called a ketubah. So in the document, they would determine the price of the dowry and what needed to be fulfilled for that. So that was the contract. So in modern day terms, if we would put this now, we would call this contract a betrothal or an engagement. But however, in the case of the Bible times, whenever they wrote a contract, this was actually a legally binding document that recognized their union. So if one was to annul this agreement or this contract, they would have to go through the process of a legal divorce, even though they've never slept together. So take instance, um, Joseph and Mary, um, when Mary was conceived by the Holy Ghost, Joseph thought to put her away and divorce her. They hadn't known each other, they weren't married yet, but they had signed a contract so that it was a legally binding contract of engagement. So young girls in Jewish times, they were often in arranged marriages from very, very young. So they were usually betrothed even by the times of like 11 to 12. And they weren't consummated or the marriage ceremonies and everything didn't proceed until the young girls had gotten their period and they were of age. So it was usually a wait between uh, a few years. Take Mary, Jesus' mother, for instance. So that was step one, which is the contract. Step two of a Jewish wedding is the consummation. So as we know, there is a period of time between the contract and the consummation spanning either several months or several years, depending on the age of the girl. So in that time, the groom or the betrothed goes back to his home and he starts raising the money uh, or the price that was set out in that contract with the bride's father and he he prepares his dwelling home. So once he's done that, he notifies the father of the bride who then states a date for the marriage to be consummated so that they would be properly husband and wife. And during this period, the bride waits with her maidens and would occupy herself with uh, personal grooming and learning domestic skills to become a fit wife. So in this period, the groom is probably the most busy um, as he's preparing his home for his future bride-to-be and raising the, pri- raising the money for that price listed in the contract. But the bride doesn't stay le- lazy either. She occupies herself and learns the trade or the skills of how to be a good wife, and she does her part as well. So after this, um, when all is said and done, the bridegroom then returns to the bride's house to escort her to the marriage ceremony. And this includes, it's a very long um, process which includes rituals, prayers, blessings, and then finally the act of consummation under this wedding canopy called a chupa, which which symbolizes their new home together. So it's a whole ordeal, um, like in the Bible times in the wedding of Cana that lasts a few days. It wasn't just a one day thing how we have now. So that was the second part of an ancient Jewish marriage. So we have the first, which is the contract. Now we have the second, which was the consummation. And finally, the one we know best is the celebration. So the one stage marriage is most known for, of course, is the celebratory part. And these are the characteristics we are most familiar with, the joy, the laughter, the food, the atmosphere, that sort of part. This would come in the form of a very lavish wedding feast that would stretch out for several days with an abundance of food, drink, and merriment. So that is roughly the historical context for this wedding sequence that's mentioned here in Matthew. So this is the event. Now for the players in this, or the characters in this story. Now the 10 virgins are mentioned as such, but given the biblical context, in relation to the bridegroom and the bride, it is safe to say that they were the role of bridesmaids. So the people who are the bridesmaids, of course, as we know, the procession and escorting the bride to the wedding ceremony was fairly custom in those days. So these virgins were usually waiting near the bride's house for the bridegroom to arrive so they could join that wedding procession. So basically, if we preface this and we say that the 10 virgins are like the bridesmaids, Um, This is how we'll set the scene. So if we think of it in a symbolic perspective, we know, we'll say that the groom is Jesus. Um, 
I know there's some variances in the symbology for this parable, but for the sake of the bridesmaid angle that I'm working with, we're just going to go with the following. So the groom is Jesus, the bridegroom is Jesus, the wedding procession is the second coming, we have the bridal party, in it is the bride, which is the church, as a movement, and as a faith, and then we have the bridesmaids, which is the virgins, or us, which are the church people. So... The bridesmaids, they represent a bridal party just as much as the bride does. So if we say that the bride is the church in the sense of the faith and the movement, we represent that bridal party just as much. They would walk alongside the bride as she made her way to the wedding ceremony, symbolizing their support and their solidarity. So if we think of this from a uh, biblical symbolic angle. So bridesmaids would ensure that the bride was at her best and properly arranged. That's an important duty. So think of us as a bridesmaid. What's the qualities that would be needed in a bridesmaid? If you were a bride and you were choosing someone to be part of your bridal party. So this is representing the bride. So what are the qualities you would look for? One, you would look for trustworthiness. You would want your bridesmaids to be trustworthy, right? You wouldn't pick a fake friend or someone that hasn't been with you through harsh, hard and tough times. You would pick one who is loyal. So another aspect would be loyalty. So bridesmaids were chosen based on their close relationship with the bride and their commitment to supporting her during the wedding preparations and celebrations because it was a long ordeal. These preparations could last for months or even years. It wasn't just a one day thing. So another quality you would look for in a bridesmaid would be availability slash devotion. So bridesmaids, they needed to be available during the entire wedding period, like I said, which could span several days or even weeks. They were expected to devote their time and energy to assist the bride with various tasks and be present during the wedding ceremonies and the feasts. Um, so that's availability. And then devotion, bridesmaids that don't backbite or destroy the reputation or sully the character of the bride. You're not going to pick people who will be part of your bridal party that speak badly about you or that are two-faced. You're going to uh, pick people who are devoted to you and who always have your back. And then another part of this story is also the oil, which is the Holy Spirit, which is a representation or a reflection of our own devotion and spiritual walk. So that's the spiritual symbolic scene I've set before you. So keep in mind, these are the good attributes you need to be a good bridesmaid like in Bible times. So I'll just repeat in the verse of Matthew, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto 10 virgins or 10 bridesmaids, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom, which is Jesus. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. I'm just going to read here from Ellen G. White in Christ Object Lessons, page 408, paragraph 2. In the parable, all the ten virgins, or bridesmaids, went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So you would think the bride picked right. She picked all of the bridesmaids that were trustworthy, that were available, that were devoted and loyal to her. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, all these bridesmaids have a knowledge of the scriptures. All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes faith is tried and when the cry is heard behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him many are unready they have no oil in their they have no oil in their vessels with their lamps they are destitute of the holy spirit that's a very powerful line just there they are destitute of the holy spirit they have nothing the scary thing is initially, there is no difference between them. You can't tell from the get-go whether these bridesmaids, all of them, were actually loyal, trustworthy, devoted, and um, available. 
So the class represented by the foolish virgins, they weren't hypocrites. We, like, we sometimes think about it and we always uh, preface the story by saying, oh, there was five wise and five foolish. They weren't like that to begin with. They weren't actually hypocrites. They had a regard for the truth, Ellen G. White says. They had advocated the truth and they were attracted to those who believed the truth. They were the same as everyone else. Um, but I think that's very interesting because these bridesmaids, they actually seemed trustworthy. They actually cared about the bride. They didn't even pretend to. They actually genuinely cared about the bride. They were loyal. They even advocated for the bride and they were available. There is, a, from like just the initial perspective, there is no difference. And they carry a lamp, a lamp with them. So meaning to say, they know what's coming. They know what the procession entails. They know it's gonna draw into night. You don't bring a lamp unless you know the bridegroom is going to come at an hour that don't, they don't know of. So that means they have they have oil. They know what the word of God says. And the Holy Spirit can still use them to make an impression at that time because they had that oil in their lamps. So they were knowledgeable bridesmaids. They weren't ignorant hypocrites. They knew what they knew what they were there for. But this is this is the very important three-letter word there. Ellen G. White says, they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. They receive the word of God with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. That's very solemn there. They receive it. They don't even reject it. They probably go out of their way to actually be in a place or an environment where they will hear the word, but they fail to assimilate or partake of its principles. This is very strong, and I'm not speaking here up front um, in a condemnating sort of way. This applies to me as much as anybody else. Um, she says, the spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent in planting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins or bridesmaids have not been content, have been content with a superficial work. So those bridesmaids, they were just happy to go along in a superficial manner. They do not know God. They know of God, but they don't know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look, and how to live. Their service to God degenerates into a form. Very solemn. Just moving on in the scriptures. While the bridegroom tarried in verse 5, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So these foolish virgins carried lamps, but lacked enough oil to keep them burning until the bridegroom arrived. Their lack of preparedness and foresight is a metaphor for the spiritual condition of those who are not vigilant and who are not ready for Christ's return. These bridesmaids, they were complacent. They were relying on the faith and devotion of others rather than cultivating a personal relationship with God. Their negligence in acquiring extra oil reflects their failure to prioritize spiritual growth and establish a firm foundation of faith. So the refusal also of the wise virgins or the wise bridesmaids to share their oil with the foolish ones indicates, as we know, that personal readiness cannot be borrowed or obtained at the last minute. We can't be riding on the skirts of somebody else's Christianity. It's sometimes easy, especially if one is born or has grown up into the church. We look to others um, as people do, and we feel like we can ride on their spiritual experience, but that's not the case. Each man and each woman has to search for their own salvation for themselves. We can't, we can't um, pass it on to someone else um, just like that. It's something that's our own personal choice. 
So we don't need, we cannot rely on each other's spiritual experience or or somebody's oil, because every time we measure our standards to somebody else around us, we fall short of God's standards. Man is not the person we should look to be our example. There are many good people in the church and people who have very good spiritual experiences, but they're not the people we should mold our characters after as they are only human. The only person we can is God because he is perfect. We can't trade and we can't share our salvation, and that's a choice we each have to make. Ellen G. White says, It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. So now, a sudden and unlooked-for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. So the ten virgins, or the ten bridesmaids, are watching in the evening of this earth's history. All claim to be Christians. All have a call, a name, a lamp, and all profess to be doing God's service. All are waiting for Christ's appearing, but five are unready. Five will be found surprised, dismayed, and outside the banquet hall. So this takes us back to that wedding sequence that I had been mentioning earlier. So first, we have the contract. How do we put this in a biblical scenario, in a biblical uh, symbolism? The contract we can turn to Ephesians 5, verses 25 to 28. This is where we'll find our own version of the contract in the Bible. Ephesians 5, 25 to 28. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So here, this is the contract. Christ offered a dowry for the bride in that he died for her and he shed his blood. That was the contract, the price of Christ's life. Jesus goes to heaven to prepare a place for us while we must get ready for our eternal lives with Christ being while we're here on earth. So that's first. We have the contract. Christ died for us. The second is the consummation. That's the second part of a wedding. And that's the second coming. Jesus will return for his virgin bride after preparing a place for us to live together in heaven. That's the event I pray we are all looking forward to. And the third part of the wedding is what is to happen in the future. Both the, we've, the contract has happened already. Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. Um, the second is the consummation, and the third is a celebration. And two and three are yet to uh, be fulfilled. So three would be the celebration, which is in heaven, the wedding feast in heaven, as mentioned in Revelation 19, 7 to 9. So we'll read about this future event, which would be Revelation 19, 7 to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So that is the celebration. As we wrap this up, I want us to bring us back to the bridesmaids and where we are in earth's point of history. So the bridegroom is coming. Jesus is coming soon. We, at the moment, we have the time and the means now to be fully equipped and prepared for an eternal life 
with him in heaven. So the bridal, the bridal party has begun its preparation. The bridesmaids, or the ten virgins, the loyal, trustworthy, available bridesmaids are equipped with the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And we are entrusted to help carry the movement or the church into its forever union with God. So we're entrusted to join or help the bride or like the church come meet the bridegroom for its forever union with God. Whatever we personally choose to do, that bride, that movement, that body of people is going to be ready to meet Christ when he comes to bring the, bar the bridal party to that marriage feast. The bride, or the church, in terms of the movement and the faith, is ready and waiting. There is a movement of people in this world who are eagerly awaiting the appearing of God and are searching their hearts and lives for anything that might be hindering them to enter in. The contract has already been fulfilled. Christ has paid the dowry with his blood and he is preparing his home for us to live forever with him. And he is coming to finalize the last stages of his marriage. The question that remains today is, will we be a part of that bridal party? That wedding, that wedding that's mentioned is happening with or without us. Will we be a foolish bridesmaid that thought she was th trustworthy, that thought she was loyal and devoted, only to find that her righteousness and her devotion was rooted in shallow level, surface level shallowness and nothing but rags? Or will we be like those wide, wise virgins where... Their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching. It helped to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honor. Shining out in the darkness, it helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom, to the marriage feast. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Those bridesmaids, they won't need to refill their lamps. They have prepared, they were devoted to their role. Christ does not bid his followers strive to shine. He says, let your light shine. If you have received the grace of God, the light is in you. Remove the obstructions and the Lord's glory will be revealed. The light will shine forth to penetrate and dispel the darkness. You cannot help shining within the range of your influence. That's what Ellen G. White said. To those who go out to meet the bridegroom is this message given. Christ is coming with power and great glory. He is coming with his own glory and with the glory of the Father. He is coming with all the holy angels with him. While all the world is plunged in darkness, there will be light in every dwelling of the saints. They will catch the first light of his second appearing. The unsullied light will shine from his splendor, and Christ the Redeemer will be admired by all who have served him. While the wicked flee from his presence, Christ's followers will rejoice. The patriarch Job, looking down to the time of Christ's second advent, said, Whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not a stranger." To his faithful followers, Christ has been a daily companion and familiar friend. They have lived in close contact, in constant communion with God. Upon them the glory of the Lord has risen. In them the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has been reflected. Now they rejoice in the undimmed rays of the brightness and the glory of the King in his majesty. They are prepared for the communion of heaven, for they have heaven in their hearts. I just want to finish with this last statement that speaks of that coming event in Revelation 19, 6 to 9, and then 7 to 14. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife had made herself ready. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He is Lord of lords and King of kings, for they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. 
So I just pray that God will help us. We have been given this time of preparation. I encourage us to use it wisely, myself included, so that we will be numbered amongst those five wise bridesmaids and not be found ourselves lacking and wanting. Let's bow our heads for a final word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you've given us this opportunity that we can spend time in your word. I pray that you'll forgive us and for me as well for the times that we have fallen short of your glory. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll help us that we can cultivate a relationship with you that is real and authentic and is a choice of our own. I pray that we will not look to others for an example, but look to you only as you are the only model that we should follow. Please be with us um, as we depart from here and as we all return to our separate lives. Um, please direct us in whatever decisions we do that it will be glorifying to you and will further your work. Give us grace, help us to um, be closer to you and be a good witness to those who are around us. Thank you for paying the price for our sins. Thank you for fulfilling that contract. And I pray that during this intermission time until we meet face to face, I pray that you will find us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.